everybody. Jason Sherman here. Today's a special episode of Future Tech. I have with me an unlikely entrepreneur, Rich Edwards. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jason. Glad to be here. It's a very relevant topic. Why data, not AI, will determine tomorrow's winners? And everything I see in the news is where AI is headed in the next, say, five years. They're saying everybody's going to lose their jobs. You know, um, what's AI going to take away from us? And you know, can it be creative? Like the Hollywood strike going on right now. There's just so many things we could cover, right? But w- sure. what I what I want to ask you, since you know you're the expert here. Um, is what exactly is missing from the hype? Like all this stuff that people are talking about, but where is the value heading that people are not talking about? That's what I want to know. Sure, sure, sure. And I'll I'll dissuade you from referring to me or considering me an expert at this point. Okay. I'm just more as somebody who's been staring at it for. The You're like me. The decade, you love so. you love AI. Gotcha. Yeah. My I, I'll just say my my context is um, I I was at IBM for many years and and ended up part of the Watson um, AI wow. launch. Jeopardy. I, yeah. I, yeah. I was one of the product managers on Developer Cloud, which was like the API based stuff. But and I've kind of been involved in that. Very since, cool little bit of an angle towards financial services and banking, but but that's kind of my perspective. So I'm, I'm more somebody who's paying attention to trends than necessarily an expert. But um, so to your point about maybe what's different is you see a lot of things, particularly around the generative AI aspect, chat GPT, a lot of the elements, a lot of some of the things coming out of um, out of uh, uh, the open source movement and, and on Meta on the Facebook side. Um, and, and one of the things to, to look at and why this is maybe different than other, you know, technical revolutions or big leaps forward is really that open source aspect. There's there's a lot of things and a lot of capabilities that are coming out um, as, as just generally available for like hobbyists to use. And you always see that at, at some point, but not nearly as capable and not nearly as in short a time period is what you're saying here. And, and one of the things that's unique about this area, particularly in AI, is um, the heritage of the people that have done most of the work here. And you can kind of point to, you know, like the Mount Rushmore type folks, right? You look at like Jeffrey Hinton uh, up at University of Toronto, um, uh, Yuan Lacoon uh, of Facebook and many other places, uh, Andrew Ng of Stanford, Google, Baidu. Um, all the big hitters. Coursera, right back, back there. They all had this like very strong, and, and many others. I just picked them as the three obvious ones. Right. Um, they all had this very strong participation of both developing the technology but then also participation from an academic standpoint, which meant they published what they did and made it widely available. And you see a, a lot of like the, the public work and the research that's that's made available to everyone, um, even even from a tooling standpoint, even from a data standpoint. Yeah, um, and you know, you're mentioning all these companies and all this work they did, and yet 99% of the world's population thinks AI just came out because of ChatGPT. Mm-hmm. So this is something that you should we should mention here is the fact that AI has been in the works probably for over 70 years, I'd say. Yeah. You know, so like, I mean, Mm -hmm. the 1950s, I think is when it really kind of started to, Mm -hmm. you know, so why don't people understand that? What has been the misconception? Why does the world, you know, what happened to the fact, to the fact that now people know about it besides chat GPT? Yeah. I I, I mean, never underestimate the power of a really good demo. (laughs) <laughs> right? and, and the accessibility of it. Um, I, I, I will just talk, you know, I had a whole second career at IBM because of what was essentially a research project of what they did with the Jeopardy challenge, right? The original kind of quote unquote Watson development in there, like spurred a lot of interest from a lot of people and, and, and a lot of investment in, in this area um, in kind of like what you know, they kind of talk about the emergence of the AI winner, right? Which was mm-hmm. kind of that time period, late 80s, early 90s, where the yeah. promise really wasn't developing, largely because the availability of the compute wasn't there. Right? Yeah. So it was the combination of cloud computing and the advancement in silicon technology. And we still needed out. huge data centers Correct. and servers. Yeah. It and was still that, down, yeah. You know, Moore's law from, from a silicon level technology standpoint, you know, making effectively graphical processor units like gpus um 
making them more widely available. Um, and, you know, all and, and, of those and, things kind of together kind of really began to combine and make it more accessible and make it available. And you mentioned, you know, IBM Watson. I mean, this this was a this was a staple on TV for Jeopardy, right? It, it was notorious for beating so many humans. Um, the chess um, go, I believe it was before that, um, yep, yep. Before that right? Uh, yep. Deep Mind. Deep yep. Mind. So, which is part of Google, yeah. These little bits and pieces of AI throughout history. I mean, we all were privy to HAL and and Space Odyssey two thousand one. We kind of saw what it could be like, right? Sure. Um, and how it goes evil, Terminator, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. we we all know that the bad, but but in the real world that we live in, we saw the good implications of AI and. As, as as far as I can tell, it's always been maybe privatized, right? It's always been private companies. I mean, governments, of course, behind the scenes are doing it. But why has it not been regulated as much as it potentially should be? I keep reading about the security risks of other countries potentially mm -hmm. using AI against us. So I, I know that government's talking about it, but why are they funding so much military and not enough AI? What, what's like, why not? Well, that, that, that's a good question from a policy standpoint, and I, I don't know that I have a, a great answer for it. Um, I, I I think from a from a regulatory standpoint, it, it becomes very difficult to see how that's even possible, um, because there really only is one kind of choke point in all this, and and, and that is really the availability of, of the compute, of the availability of, of graphical processor units, which you know, huge capacity got built up, particularly driven around um, crypto and like Bitcoin gaming mining and things like that. Yeah. And when that began to crash, a lot of those GPUs began to got a lot cheaper. There's some weird economics around all this. but Oh, I know. I, 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 I snagged right. a beautiful GPU for gaming on the real cheap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and now you can't get it. Right. And yeah. you, you look at the valuation of NVIDIA today. It's it's all based skyrocketed on the demand and the expected demand of how much more workflow is going to be running across the GPU, you know, at like not insignificant percentages of our GDP or the world's GDP. Right. Um, so you're just kind of seeing where it's where it's going. So let's dig so, into that. Digging into yeah. you mentioned Nvidia and the GPUs and they, their valuation has skyrocketed. You're saying what the perceived value going forward? Where do you see businesses, entrepreneurs, you know, privateers using AI to to go forward? I mean, we're doing mid-journey images, we're doing yeah. ChatGPT assistance, but what else? So the, I mean, the low hanging fruit is always like the efficiency type stuff, right? And the the precursor to that was a whole segment of of software called RPA. A robotic process automation in in my neck of the woods looking at like insurance financial services you know things like mortgage loan application all the underwriting stuff boring things documents like rule-based <laughs> you know where it's there, there's an audit trail that has to be maintained anything that like takes even minutes out of a single application is very valuable there's been a lot of investment there, right um so there's an assumption of like okay so the next thing is well let's apply this just to other places and, you know, save time, reduce error, you know, things that kind of look and smell like efficiency. And that's one angle, but it's only incremental. I think what's what the real opportunity is and where we're going to see the bigger bang is like real in the classical sense of disruption, meaning completely changing the business model of, of a company or a segment, not just to make it like good enough and cheaper, but to make it available for customers that aren't even buying today. Hmm. Um, I saw, I read a really good article. Uh, it was, uh, Alex Rample at, uh, Andreessen Horowitz wrote, okay. and it, we're kind of talking about like, okay, so here's an example of like stuff nobody's thought of, or like, isn't in the works. And the example he gave, he says, look, LVMH, right. Biggest luxury good maker in the world. They, they spend tens of millions of dollars on, you know, preventing fraud, doing, uh, you, you know, all the weird local legal machinations to kind of prevent that import export stuff, like just running down, protecting wow. the brand, protecting the marks. He says, and they, they, they spend a tremendous amount of money. Now, would everybody who has an e-store on Shopify like to do something like that? Mm. Yes, but it's clearly out of their reach because they're it's not expensive. hiring, right? Like the, the white shoes law firm to get it done. Now, what if you could get, 70% of the efficacy of that like mm. for like a $1,500 annual subscription. Yeah. Well, almost wow. Almost all of them would subscribe to that. That's right? insane. Then, 
that's an example of like bringing a different value to a whole nother set of consumers that aren't even buying today. Right. And that so, is, that is the big bang of technical. Disruption. Essentially you're saying that <laughs> what is normally available to the elite uh, is now available to the masses. And this is historically what has happened to humans in general, right? Yes. Is, is There's always a, f a far few between of the one percenters versus the 99 percenters of everybody else. So it almost sounds like AI is giving some of the control, the power, the resources to everybody in a way where before that they really could not afford that. Or, or at least a access, if nothing else. Yeah, but th that's yeah. huge. Yeah, that's that's huge. Um, so that's a great example. Uh, do you have another one maybe in like the financial market? Because I know people are talking about how AI can start helping you decide on stocks. And you mentioned crypto and like sure. maybe maybe a trading bot if that's going to ever happen. And if so, can't everybody do that then? Can we all just make yeah. money every day no, doing it? Absolutely in the works, right? It'll it'll begin to make you know, things that, again, have a very limited accessibility to them, accessible to, to more people. Um, I think you'll see things like easier to get, you mm. know, easier to buy. And now accessible, you know, via mobile that before was, no, I had to have like a business relationship with somebody right. and work through it that way. But the, the, the one thing I do want to talk about that, that is different is like before, like we were talking about before, other technical revolutions, the, the open source part of this, like why, one of the things that makes this interesting is one, it's more broadly available, but two, the linchpin part of it is the data on which the algorithms work, the mm. training data that goes into it. That is still a scarce resource. And I, I think it's one that's not widely appreciated as a scarce resource, which means it's undervalued. Is that because companies don't want to give their data up to these AIs? Is that the main reason? Oh, yeah. No, ab absolutely. You see a fair amount of that. And what's interesting is you see a bigger fear and reluctance or maybe recognition of the value of what we have mm. in larger organizations. Um, interesting. There, there was there was an interview a couple of weeks ago with the CIO of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Mm -hmm. biggest biggest retail huge among other things but but biggest consumer bank at least in the u.s I, there's a couple in china that may have them beat but you know for over 100 years or more oh, you, you, you. <laughs> like three four trillion dollars worth of assets like <laughs> they're like yeah ai is the future it's great we're 100 percent behind it we have completely restricted access to it for all three hundred thousand employees and it's like okay well what's what's that about and it's right. like Right now, this is there's too much liability for us. It's it's too scary. Wow. Again, they're a regulated industry, so you know you look at you know right finance, fintech, and certainly healthcare are like the big two. Government kind of being the third one, right? Where where a lot of times data data access is the third rail. But but what that means is they're competing against a slew of long tail, very small custom co companies. Yep. And competitors and substitutes that frankly don't have that much risk around that as so well. So they're taking the chance. Probably willing to step out and try it and do it and begin to offer and compete at almost that level of service. Wow. At least for niche as a customer. So I, I really believe that this is a huge opportunity for smaller customers, for certainly players that are not incumbents, new companies. I mean, you just look at the amount of money from a venture standpoint that's flowing yeah. into the space that gives you a sense of where billions and billions. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. But, I, but the thing about it is, and the thing that I don't think is appreciated is especially for, for companies that have been around for a long time and have a lot of information and insight, whether it's institutional or it's actual hard data they have structured or unstructured, all of that is going to be available and leverageable in their areas. The things that they know about their customers, their markets, where they play is valuable. And what a lot of this capability is, particularly as it gets more and more democratized, more and more accessible available. Yeah. from a technical standpoint and from a cost standpoint, as it becomes more available, all of that, that, that information and that data becomes easier and easier to use and turn into insights and leverage as part of your business model. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and I trust me, I've been following all of it too. And I think it's fantastic. I'm excited to see where AI is headed as well. Uh, wh where uh, can people find out more about what you do and what you offer? 
Sure. Uh, my, my company is uh, Mindspan Systems. We're mindspaninc.com. Um, I am I am happy to to talk and and deal with anybody, even if they're not you know potentially at our market. Uh, I'm most active on on LinkedIn, and you can okay. reach me at, at uh, LinkedIn slash in slash Rich Edwards. Awesome. Thanks, Rich. This was really awesome, and I look forward to seeing what happens with AI in the future. Hope you guys learned something, and we'll see you in the next episode. <music>